The Blue Geranium by Agatha Christie Narrated by Tony Walker When I was down here last year, said Sir Henry Clithering, and stopped. His hostess, Mrs Bantry, looked at him curiously. The ex-commissioner of Scotland Yard was staying with old friends of his, Colonel and Mrs Bantry, who lived near St Mary Mead. Mrs. Bantry, pen in hand, had just asked his advice as to who should be invited to make a sixth guest at dinner that evening. Uh, yes, said Mrs. Bantry encouragingly, when you were here last year. Tell me, said Sir Henry, do you know a Miss Marple? Mrs. Bantry was surprised. It was the last thing she had expected. No, Miss Marple, who doesn't? the typical old maid of fiction, quite a dear but hopelessly behind the times. Do you mean you would like me to ask her to dinner? You are surprised? A, a little, I must confess. I should hardly have thought you, but perhaps there's an explanation. The explanation is simple enough. When I was down here last year, we got into the habit of discussing unsolved mysteries. There were five or six of us. Raymond West, the novelist, started it. We each supplied a story to which we knew the answer, but nobody else did. It was supposed to be an exercise in the deductive faculties, to see who could get nearest the truth. Well, like in the old story, we hardly realised that Miss Marple was playing, but we were very polite about it, we didn't want to hurt the old dear's feelings, and, and now comes the cream of the jest. The old lady outdid us every time. What? I assure you, straight to the truth, like a homing pigeon. But how extraordinary! Why, dear old Miss Marple has hardly ever been out of St. Mary Mead. Ah, but according to her, that has given her unlimited opportunities of observing human nature, uh, under the microscope, as it were. I suppose there's something in that, conceded Mrs. Bantry. One would at least know the petty side of people, but I don't think we have any really exciting criminals in our midst. I think we must try her with Arthur's ghost story after dinner. I'd be thankful if she'd find a solution to that. I didn't know that Arthur believed in ghosts. Oh, he doesn't. That's what worries him so. And it happened to a friend of his, George Pritchard, a most uh, prosaic person. It's really rather tragic for poor George. Either this extraordinary story is true, or, or else... Or else what? Mrs Bantry did not answer. After a minute or two, she said irrelevantly, You know, I like George. Everyone does. One can't believe that he... But people do do such extraordinary things. Sir Henry nodded. He knew better than Mrs. Bantry the extraordinary things that people did. So it came about that that evening Mrs. Bantry looked round her dinner table, shivering a little as she did so because the dining room, like most English dining rooms, was extremely cold, and fixed her gaze on the very upright old lady sitting on her husband's right. Miss Marple wore black lace mittens. An old lace fichu was draped around her shoulders, and another piece of lace surmounted her white hair. She was talking animatedly to the elderly doctor, Dr Lloyd, about the workhouse and the suspected shortcomings of the district nurse. Mrs Bantry marvelled anew. She even wondered whether Sir Henry had been making an elaborate joke, uh, but there seemed no point in that. Incredible that what he had said could be really true. Her glance went on and rested affectionately on her red-faced, broad-shouldered husband as he sat talking horses to Janet Hellier, the beautiful and popular actress. Jane, more beautiful, if that were possible, off the stage than on, opened enormous blue eyes and murmured at discreet intervals, Really? Oh, fancy! How extraordinary! She knew nothing whatever about horses and cared less. Arthur, said Mrs Bantry, you're boring poor Jane to distraction. Leave horses alone and tell her your ghost story instead. You know, George Pritchard. Eh, Dolly? Oh, but I don't know. Sir Henry wants to hear it too. I was telling him something about it this morning. It would be interesting to hear what everyone has to say about it. Oh, do, said Jane. I love ghost stories. Well, Colonel Bantry hesitated. I've never believed much in the supernatural, but this, 
I don't think any of you know George Pritchard. He's one of the best. His wife, well, she's dead now, poor woman. I just say this much. She didn't give George any too easy a time when she was alive. She was one of those semi-invalids. I believe she had really something wrong with her, but whatever it was, she played it for all it was worth. She was capricious, exacting, unreasonable. She complained from morning to night. George was expected to wait on her hand and foot, and everything he did was always wrong, and he got cursed for it. Most men, I'm fully convinced, would have hit her over the head with a hatchet long ago. Hey, Dolly, isn't that so? She was a dreadful woman, said Mrs Bantry with conviction. If George Pritchard had brained her with a hatchet, and there had been any woman on the jury, he would have been triumphantly acquitted. I don't quite know how this business started. George was rather vague about it. I gather Mrs. Pritchard had always had a weakness for fortune-tellers, palmists, clairvoyants, uh, anything of that sort. George didn't mind if she found amusement in it well and good, but he refused to go into rhapsodies himself, and that was another grievance. A succession of hospital nurses was always passing through the house, Mrs. Pritchard usually becoming dissatisfied with them after a few weeks. One young nurse had been very keen on this fortune-telling stunt, and for a time Mrs. Pritchard had been very fond of her. Then she suddenly fell out with her and insisted on her going. She had back another nurse who had been with her previously, an older woman, experienced and tactful in dealing with a neurotic patient. Nurse Copling, according to George, was a very good sort, a sensible woman to talk to. She put up with Mrs. Pritchard's tantrums and nerve storms with complete indifference. Mrs. Pritchard always lunched upstairs, and it was usual at lunchtime for George and the nurse to come to some arrangement for the afternoon. Strictly speaking, the nurse went off from two to four, but to oblige, as the phrase goes, she would sometimes take her time off after tea if George wanted to be free for the afternoon. On this occasion, she mentioned that she was going to see a sister at Golders Green and might be a little late returning. George's face fell, for he had arranged to play a round of golf. Nurse Copling, however, reassured him. We'll neither of us be missed, Mr Pritchard. A twinkle came into her eye. Mrs Pritchard going to have more exciting company than ours. Who's that? Wait a minute. Nurse Copling's eyes twinkled more than ever. Let me get it right. Zarida. "'Psychic reader of the future!' "'Oh, Lord!' groaned George. "'That's a new one, isn't it? "'Quite new. "'I believe my predecessor, Nurse Carstairs, sent her along. Uh, "'Mrs Pritchard hasn't seen her yet. "'She made me write, fixing an appointment for this afternoon. "'Well, at any rate, I shall get my golf,' said George, "'and he went off with the kindliest feelings towards the reader, "'the reader of the future. "'On his return to the house,' George found Mrs. Pritchard in a state of great agitation. She was, as usual, lying on her invalid couch, and she had a bottle of smelling salts in her hand, which she sniffed at frequent intervals. George, she exclaimed, what did I tell you about this house? The moment I came into it, I felt there was something wrong. Didn't I tell you so at the time? Repressing his desire to reply, you always do, George said, uh, no, can't say I remember it. You never do remember anything that has to do with me. Men are all extraordinarily callous. But I really believe that you are even more insensitive than most. Oh, come now, Mary dear, that's not fair. Well, as I was telling you, this woman knew at once. She, she actually blenched, if you know what I mean, as she came in at the door, and she said, There is evil here, evil and danger. I feel it. Very unwisely, George laughed. Well, you have had your money's worth this afternoon. His wife closed her eyes and took a long sniff from her smelling bottle. How you hate me! You would jeer and laugh if I were dying. George protested, and after a minute or two she went on. You may laugh, but I shall tell you the whole thing. This house is definitely dangerous to me. The woman said so. George's formerly kind feeling towards Zarida underwent a change. He knew his wife was perfectly capable of insisting on moving to a new house if the caprice got hold of her. What else did she say? he asked. She couldn't tell me very much. She was so upset. One thing she did say, I had some violets in a glass. She pointed at them and cried out, 
Take those away. No blue flowers. Never have blue flowers. Blue flowers are fatal to you. Remember that. And, you know, added Mrs. Pritchard, I always have told you that blue as a colour is repellent to me. I feel a natural instinctive sort of warning against it. George was much too wise to remark that he had never heard her say so before. Instead, he asked what the mysterious Zarida was like. Mrs. Pritchard entered with gusto upon a description. Black hair in coiled knobs over her ears. Her eyes were half-closed. Great black rims round them. She had a black veil over her mouth and chin, and she spoke in a kind of singing voice with a marked foreign accent, uh, Spanish, I think. In fact, all the usual uh, stock in trade, said George cheerfully. His wife immediately closed her eyes. I feel extremely ill, she said. Ring for nurse. Unkindness upsets me, as you know only too well. It was two days later that Nurse Copling came to George with a grave face. Will you come to Mrs. Pritchard, please? She has had a letter which upsets her greatly. He found his wife with a letter in her hand. She held it out to him. Read it, she said. George read it. It was on heavily scented paper and the writing was big and black. I have seen the future. Be warned before it is too late. Beware of the full moon. The blue primrose means warning. The blue hollyhock means danger. The blue geranium means death. Just about to burst out laughing, George caught Nurse Copling's eye. She made a quick warning gesture. He said rather awkwardly, Ah, the woman's probably trying to frighten you, Mary. Anyway, there aren't such things as blue primroses and blue geraniums. But Mrs Pritchard began to cry and say her days were numbered. Nurse Copling came out with George upon the landing. Of all the silly tomfoolery, he burst out. I suppose it is. Something in the nurse's tone struck him, and he stared at her in amazement. Surely, nurse, you don't believe... Uh, no, no, Mr Pritchard, I don't believe in reading the future. That's nonsense. What puzzles me is the meaning of this. Fortune tellers are usually out for what they can get, but this woman seems to be frightening Mrs Pritchard with no advantage to herself. I can't see the point. There's another thing. Yes. Mrs. Pritchard says that something about Zarida was faintly familiar to her. Well, well, I don't like it, Mr. Pritchard, that's all. I didn't know you were so superstitious, nurse. I'm not superstitious, but I know when a thing is fishy. It was about four days after this that the first incident happened. To explain it to you, I shall have to describe Mrs. Pritchard's room. You better let me do that, interrupted Mrs. Bantry. It was papered with one of those new wall papers where you apply clumps of flowers to make a kind of herbaceous border. The effect is almost like being in a garden, though, of course, the flowers are all wrong. I mean, they simply couldn't be in bloom all at the same time. Don't let a passion for horticultural accuracy run away with you, Dolly, said her husband. We all know you're an enthusiastic gardener. Well, it is absurd, Mrs. Bantry protested, to have bluebells and daffodils and lupins and hollyhocks and Michaelmas daisies all grouped together. Most unscientific, said Sir Henry, but to proceed with the story? Well, um, among these massed flowers were primroses, clumps of yellow and pink primroses, and, oh, go on, Arthur, this is your story. Colonel Bantry took up the tale. Mrs. Pritchard rang her bell violently one morning. The household came running, thought she was an extremist. Not at all. She was violently excited and pointing at the wallpaper. And there, sure enough, was one blue primrose in the midst of the others. Oh, said Miss Hellier, how creepy. The question was, hadn't the blue primrose always been there? That was George's suggestion, and the nurse's but Mrs. Pritchard wouldn't have it at any price. She had never noticed it till that very morning, and the night before had been full moon. She was very upset about it. I met George Pritchard that same day, and he told me about it, said Mrs. Bantry. I went to see Mrs. Pritchard and did my best to ridicule the whole thing, but without success. I came away really concerned, and I remember I met Jean Instow and told her about it. Uh, Jean's a queer girl, she said. So she's really upset about it. 
I told her that I thought the woman was perfectly capable of dying of fright. She was really abnormally superstitious. I remember Jean rather startled me with what she said next. She said, well, that might be all for the best, mightn't it? And she said it so coolly, in so matter-of-a-fact tone, that I was really, well, shocked. Of course, I know it's done nowadays to be brutal and outspoken, but I never get used to it. Jean smiled at me rather oddly and said, You don't like me saying that, but it's true. What use is Mrs Pritchard's life to her? None at all. And it's hell for George Pritchard. To have his wife frightened out of existence would be the best thing that could happen to him. I said, George is most awfully good to her, always. And she said, Yes, he deserves a reward, poor dear. He's a very attractive person, George Pritchard. The last nurse thought so, the pretty one, what was her name, Carstairs. That was the cause of the row between her and Mrs P. Now, I didn't like hearing Jean say that. Of course, one had wondered. Mrs Bantry paused significantly. Yes, dear, said Miss Marple placidly. One always does. Is Miss Instow a pretty girl? Uh, I suppose she plays golf. Yes, she's good at all games. And she's nice-looking, attractive-looking, very fair with a healthy skin and nice steady blue eyes. Of course, we have always felt that she and George Pritchard, I mean, if things had been different, they're so well suited to one another. And they were great friends, asked Miss Marple. Oh, yes, great friends. Do you think, Dolly, said Colonel Bantry plaintively, that I might be allowed to go on with my story? Arthur, said Mrs Bantry resignedly, wants to get back to his ghosts. I had the rest of the story from George himself, went on the Colonel. There's no doubt that Mrs Pritchard got the wind up badly towards the end of the next month. She marked off on a calendar the day when the moon would be full, and on that night she had both the nurse and then George into her room and made them study the wallpaper carefully. There were pink hollyhocks and red ones, but there were no blue amongst them. Then, when George left the room, she locked the door. And in the morning there was a large blue hollyhock, said Mrs. Hellier joyfully. Quite right, said Colonel Bantry, or at any rate, nearly right. One flower of a hollyhock just above her head had turned blue. It staggered George. And of course the more it staggered him, the more he refused to take the thing seriously. He insisted that the whole thing was some kind of practical joke. He ignored the evidence of the locked door and the fact that Mrs. Pritchard discovered the change before anyone, even Nurse Copling, was admitted. It staggered George, and it made him unreasonable. His wife wanted to leave the house, and he wouldn't let her. He was inclined to believe in the supernatural for the first time, but he wasn't going to admit it. He usually gave in to his wife, but this time he wouldn't. Mary was not to make a fool of herself, he said. The whole thing was the most infernal nonsense. And so the next month sped away. Mrs. Pritchard made less protest than one might have imagined. I think she was superstitious enough to believe that she couldn't escape her fate. She repeated again and again the blue primrose, warning. The blue hollyhock, danger. The blue geranium, death. And she would lie looking at the clump of pinky red geraniums nearest her bed. The whole business was pretty nervy. Even the nurse caught the infection. She came to George two days before full moon and begged him to take Mrs. Pritchard away. George was angry. If all the flowers on that damned wall turned into blue devils, it couldn't kill anyone, he shouted. It might. Shock has killed people before now. Nonsense, said George. George has always been a shade pig-headed. You can't drive him. I believe he had a secret idea that his wife worked the changes herself, and that it was all some morbid hysterical plan of hers. Well, the fatal night came. Mrs. Pritchard locked her door as usual. She was very calm, in almost an exalted state of mind. The nurse was worried by her state, wanted to give her a stimulant, an injection of strychnine, but Mrs. Pritchard refused. In a way, I believe, she was enjoying herself. George said she was. I think that's quite possible, said Mrs. Bantry. There must have been a strange sort of glamour about the whole thing. There was no violent ringing of the bell the next morning. Mrs. Pritchard usually woke about eight. When at eight-thirty there was no sign from her, nurse rapped loudly on the door. 
Getting no reply, she fetched George and insisted on the door being broken open. They did so with the help of a chisel. One look at the still figure on the bed was enough for Nurse Copling. She sent George to telephone for the doctor, but it was too late. Mrs. Pritchard, he said, must have been dead at least eight hours. Her smelling salts lay by her hand on the bed, and on the wall beside her, one of the pinky-red geraniums, was a bright, deep blue. Horrible, said Miss Hellier with a shiver. Sir Henry was frowning. No additional details? Colonel Bantry shook his head, but Mrs. Bantry spoke quickly. The gas. What about the gas? asked Sir Henry. When the doctor arrived, there was a slight smell of gas, and sure enough, he found the gas ring in the fireplace very slightly turned on, but so little that it couldn't have mattered. Did Mr. Pritchard and the nurse not notice it when they first went in? The nurse said she did notice a slight smell. George said he didn't notice gas, but something made him feel very queer and overcome, but he put it down to shock, and probably it was. At any rate, there was no question of gas poisoning. The smell was scarcely noticeable. And that's the end of the story. No, it isn't. One way and another, there was a lot of talk. The servants, you see, had overheard things, had heard, for instance, Mrs. Pritchard telling her husband that he hated her and would jeer if she were dying, and also more recent remarks. She had said one day, apropos of his refusing to leave the house, Very well, when I'm dead, I hope everyone will realise that you have killed me. And, as ill luck would have it, he had been mixing some weed killer for the garden paths the day before. One of the younger servants had seen him, and had afterwards seen him taking up a glass of hot milk to his wife. The talk spread and grew. The doctor had given a certificate, I don't know exactly in what terms, shock, a syncope, heart failure, uh, probably some medical term meaning nothing much. However, the poor lady had not been a month in her grave before an exhumation order was applied for and granted. And the result of the autopsy was nil, I remember, said Sir Henry gravely, a case for once of smoke without fire. The whole thing is really very curious, said Mrs. Bantry. The fortune teller, for instance, Zareda, at the address where she was supposed to be, no one had ever heard of such a person. She appeared once, out of the blue, said her husband, and then utterly vanished out of the blue. <laughs> That's rather good. And, and what is more, continued Mrs. Bantry, little nurse Carstairs, who was supposed to have recommended her, had never even heard of her. They looked at each other. It's a mysterious story, said Dr. Lloyd. One can make guesses, but to guess... He shook his head. Has Mr. Pritchard married Miss Instow? asked Mrs. Marple in a gentle voice. Now why do you ask that? inquired Sir Henry. Miss Marple opened her gentle blue eyes. It seems to me so important, she said. Have they married? Colonel Bantry shook his head. We, well, we expected something of the kind, but it's eighteen months now. I don't believe they even see much of each other. That is important, said Miss Marple, very important. Then you think the same as I do, said Mrs. Bantry. You think... Now, Dolly, said her husband, it's unjustifiable what you're going to say. You can't go about accusing people without a shadow of proof. Don't be so, so manly, Arthur. Men are always afraid to say anything. Anyway, this is all between ourselves. It's just a wild, fantastic idea of mine that possibly, only possibly, Jean Instow disguised herself as a fortune teller. Mind you, she may have done it for a joke. I don't for a minute think that she meant any harm. But if she did do it, and if Mrs. Pritchard was foolish enough to die of fright, well, that's what Miss Marple meant, wasn't it? No, dear, not quite said Miss Marple. You see, if I were going to kill anyone, which of course I wouldn't dream of doing for a minute because it would be very wicked, and besides, I don't like killing, not even wasps, though I know it has to be, and I'm sure the gardener does it as humanely as possible. Uh, let me see, what was I saying? If you wish to kill anyone, prompted Sir Henry. Oh yes, well, if I did, I shouldn't be at all satisfied to trust to fright. I know one reads of people dying of it, but it seems a very uncertain sort of thing, and the most nervous people 
are far more brave than one really thinks they are. I should like something definite and certain and make a thoroughly good plan about it. Miss Marple, said Sir Henry, you frighten me. I hope you will never wish to remove me. Your plans will be too good. Miss Marple looked at him reproachfully. I thought I had made it clear that I would never contemplate such wickedness, she said. No, I was trying to put myself in the place of a, a certain person. Do you mean George Pritchard? asked Colonel Bantry. I'll never believe it of George, though, mind you, even a nurse believes it. I went and saw her about a month afterwards, at the time of the exhumation. She didn't know how it was done. In fact, she wouldn't say anything at all. But it was clear enough that she believed George to be in some way responsible for his wife's death. She was convinced of it. Well, said Dr Lloyd, perhaps she wasn't so far wrong. And mind you, a nurse often knows. She can't say. She's got no proof. But she knows. Sir Henry leant forward. Come now, Miss Marple, he said persuasively. You're lost in a daydream. Won't you tell us all about it? Miss Marple started and turned pink. I beg your pardon, she said. I was just thinking about our district nurse, a most difficult problem. More difficult than the problem of the blue geranium? It really depends on the primroses, said Miss Marple. I mean, Mrs Bantry said that they were yellow and pink. If it was a pink primrose that turned blue, of course, that fits perfectly. But if it happened to be a yellow one, it was a pink one, said Mrs Bantry. She stared. They all stared at Miss Marple. Then that seems to settle it, said Miss Marple. She shook her head regretfully. And the wasp season and everything, and of course the gas. It reminds you, I suppose, of countless village tragedies, said Sir Henry. Not tragedies said Miss Marple, and certainly nothing criminal, but it does remind me a little of the trouble we are having with the district nurse. After all, nurses are human beings, and what with having to be so correct in their behaviour and wearing those uncomfortable collars and being so thrown with the family, well, can you wonder that things sometimes happen? A glimmer of light broke upon Sir Henry. You mean Nurse Carstairs? Oh, no, not Nurse Carstairs, Nurse Coppling. You see, she had been there before and very much thrown with Mr. Pritchard, who you say is an attractive man. I dare say she thought, poor thing, well, we needn't go into that. I don't suppose she knew about Miss Instow, and of course, afterwards, when she found out, it turned her against him, and she tried to do all the harm she could. Of course, the letter really gave her away, didn't it? What letter? Well, she wrote to the fortune-teller at Mrs. Pritchard's request, and the fortune-teller came, apparently, in answer to the letter. But later it was discovered that there never had been such a person at that address. So that shows that Nurse Copling was in it. She only pretended to write. So what could be more likely than that she was the fortune-teller herself? I never saw the point about the letter, said Sir Henry. That's a most important point, of course. Rather a bold step to take, said Miss Marple, because Mrs Pritchard might have recognised her in spite of the disguise, though, of course, if she had, the nurse could have pretended it was a joke. What did you mean, said Sir Henry, when you said that if you were a certain person, you would not have trusted to fright? One couldn't be sure that way, said Miss Marple. No, I think that the warnings and the blue flowers were, if I may use a military term, she laughed self-consciously, just camouflage. And the real thing? I know, said Miss Marple apologetically, that I've got wasps on the brain, uh, poor things, destroyed in their thousands, and usually on such a beautiful summer's day. But I remember thinking when I saw the gardener shaking up the cyanide of potassium in a bottle with water, how like smelling salts it looked. And if it were put in a smelling salt bottle and substituted for the real one, well, the poor lady was in the habit of using her smelling salts. Indeed, you said they were found by her hand. Then, of course, while Mr Pritchard went to telephone to the doctor, the nurse would change it for the real bottle. And she'd just turn on the gas a little bit to mask any smell of almonds, and in case anyone felt queer. And I have always heard that cyanide leaves no trace if you wait long enough. But of course, I may be wrong, and it may have been something entirely different in the bottle.' 
but that doesn't really matter, does it? Miss Marple paused, a little out of breath. Jane Hellier leant forward and said, But the blue geranium and the other flowers. Nurses always have litmus paper, don't they? said Miss Marple. Well, for, for testing. Not a very pleasant subject. We won't dwell on it. I have done a little nursing myself. She grew delicately pink. Blue turns red with acids and red turns blue with alkalis. So easy to paste some red litmus over a red flower, near the bed, of course, and then, when the poor lady used her smelling salts, the strong ammonia fumes would turn it blue. Really most ingenious. Of course, the geranium wasn't blue when they first broke into the room. Nobody noticed it till afterwards. When Nurse changed the bottles, she held the sal ammoniac against the wallpaper for a minute, I expect. "'You might have been there, Miss Marple,' said Sir Henry. "'What worries me,' said Miss Marple, "'is poor Mr. Pritchard and that nice girl, Miss Instow, "'probably both suspecting each other and keeping apart, "'and life so very short.' "'She shook her head. "'You needn't worry,' said Sir Henry. "'As a matter of fact, I have something up my sleeve. "'A nurse has been arrested on a charge of murdering "'an elderly patient who had left her a legacy. "'It was done with cyanide of potassium "'substituted for smelling salts.' Nurse Copling trying the same trick again. Miss Instow and Mr. Pritchard need have no doubts as to the truth. Now, isn't that nice? cried Miss Marple. I don't mean about the new murder, of course. That's very sad and shows how much wickedness there is in the world. And that if once you give way, which reminds me, I must finish my little conversation with Dr. Lloyd about the village nurse. <laughs> So that was The Blue Geranium by Agatha Christie. Um, just to tell you something about her, if you don't know anything about her, Dame Agatha Mary Clarissa Christie, born on September 15th, 1819, Torquay, Devon, England, was a highly acclaimed British author known for her prolific contributions to the mystery genre. Often referred to as the Queen of Crime, Christie created some of the most iconic fictional detectives in literature, including Hercule Poirot and Miss Marple, who we've just heard about. Christie's writing career took off after the publication of her first novel, The Mysterious Affair at Styles, in 1920, introducing Hercule Poirot to the world. Over the course of her prolific career, she wrote 66 detective novels, 14 short story collections, and the world's longest-running play, The Mouse Trap. I remember seeing that once in a theatre in London with no room for my knees at all. It was the most agonising um, period I ever sat down so I couldn't I mean the story was quite fun but it, you were just really conscious of how uncomfortable you were her works have been translated into numerous languages making her one of the best selling authors in history notable novels include The Murder on the Orient Express Death on an Island and Then There Were None Christie's storytelling prowess clever plot twists and keen understanding of human nature have secured her a lasting legacy in the realm of mystery literature Agatha Christie received various accolades during her lifetime, including the title of Dame Commander of the Order of the British Empire in 1971. She passed away on January 12, 1976, leaving behind a remarkable literary legacy that continues to captivate readers worldwide. The Blue Geranium is a short story penned by Agatha Christie, written by Agatha Christie, as I prefer to say. It first came out in the Storyteller magazine in December 1929 and later in Pictorial Review in the US in January 1930. This story is the seventh one in a series called The Tuesday Night Club, following a break of 18 months since the last story. In 1932, The Blue Geranium was included in the seventh collection of short stories titled The Thirteen Problems. It comes after the story of the thumb mark of St. Peter and before the companion. So the funny thing about that is um, I think the wit of the writing shines. Just You can just imagine these people sitting around at a dinner party in some small village somewhere, very bourgeois, and uh, Sir Henry's there, and he's been an ex-copper. And Miss Marple, who... Um, remarkably, has never been outside the village of Mary Mead, uh, has such an insight. You could do that by reading. And last week we did, or last time we did, uh, the Sherlock Holmes story, um, the Sussex Vampire, and you can see how the format is similar. There is a, there is a detective who has fantastic deducing powers, uh, powers of deduction, and you simply introduce them to the facts, and they 
merely need to, they might need to ask a few questions, but merely they know the answer straight away. They just deduce it all. D, 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 D. And I suppose the, um, they are uh, who done it, aren't they? Who did these things? And when we find out how, we want to know, we want to know how. It's how did they do it as well. So it's who did it and how. Uh, and very neat little story anyway. So I quite like that. Um, so this is the second story in the Classic Detective Stories podcast. There will be a few more. But well, hopefully it will go from strength to strength. Please tell your friends uh, and um, share, like, comment if, if you've got something nice to say. <laughs> if it's not nice, yeah, don't comment. Uh, and uh, see you next week. Okay. Okay.